Well, thank you, BJ, and that's actually the third solo I've heard him sing this morning, and they were all good. So, uh, BJ, thank you so much for ministering uh, not only to us but unto the Lord, and uh, what a blessing we have that God has given us so much talent here to be able to, to share with us, and I'm so appreciative of everyone who again who's made this possible uh you know if you don't see the people behind the scenes you don't understand the the sacrifice they've made uh for us to be able to do this so uh, guys thank you for all that you're doing amen uh, a lot of folks uh, who are helping out uh i found out last week when uh if you view the uh, message on youtube uh, I found out last week that it takes Amber about three hours to get that done for us. And so I really appreciate what she does. Like I said, a lot of folks sacrifice, and uh, we, we really appreciate what they are doing. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter number four. And... This morning we are transitioning from the church age to the last years on earth. In chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, chapter 4, verse number 1, the scripture reads this way. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Father, would you speak to us this morning? And God, help us to understand your word. Father, would you open your word to us so that we might understand you and everything that we're looking at today. Father, I pray your anointing upon this time. Lord, we ask these things now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I want you to go back to the first chapter of Revelation for just a moment. So we can explain how Revelation is divided. In chapter 1, verse 19, listen to what John writes. He is told in verse 19, chapter 1, Write the things which thou hast seen. In the first chapter, he has seen the vision of the risen Lord. Those are the things which he has seen. And then, and the things which are. That is chapter 2 and chapter 3. That, are, that is the churches that we have been looking at over the past seven weeks or so. That is what is called from the time of uh, after Jesus was resurrected to the end of the church age. And the church age ends with the rapture of the church. And then he said, the things which shall be hereafter. That is what we saw in chapter 4, verse 1. He was told to come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. Now, before all these things can take place, something has to happen in the world. And before I go, if, if you've got your engine on, please cut it off. People are trying to, some folks can't hear because the engines are running. So if you got, please turn that off, please. Uh, okay. So what happens is the church has to be taken out. That's what I want to speak to you this morning on the rapture of the church. Now, people say, well, what exactly does that mean? And when does this occur? Well, the scripture 
teaches us. And if you have your Bible, and we're going to be looking through different parts of the Scripture this morning, I want to invite you to go back to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus describes how it's going to be when this rapture takes place. Now, the rapture means this. It means literally to snatch away. And we're going to be looking further at that in just a few moments at some of the passages that speak about uh, the rapture of the church. But listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then he describes how it's going to be when this rapture, when Jesus comes back for the church. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that they were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What was Jesus trying to teach us? He was trying to teach us that it would come about all of a sudden. People would be doing life just as they normally have done. And then all of a sudden, in the day of Noah, the flood came. Noah had been preaching for 120 years, but no one listened to him except his family. And so because they were not in the ark, they were judged. And so when the church is taken out of this world, then begins the tribulation period. Now, if we were in the tribulation period, we would know exactly when Jesus was going to come back. Because the scripture says the tribulation period is going to be seven years. So we would know exactly when Jesus is coming back. But we're not waiting for tribulation. We are looking for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to think with me for just a few moments about the rapture of the church. Because when that happens, the scripture says it's going to be immediate. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Very quickly, he said, this is what's going to take place. Before you can have a twinkling of the eye, Jesus is going to come back. Now, think about this. Eternity is very long. And eternity, your eternity, my eternity... Where I will spend eternity, I am one breath away from eternity. I wonder, several years ago, when the <clears throat> fellow from Australia, Steve Irvin, was filming that documentary, if he ever thought that in just a few minutes he would be in eternity. He was struck by a stingray in the chest many times and he died almost immediately. I think about the space shuttle in 1986 when the first woman was put in space and 73 seconds after the launch, Challenger exploded. I wonder in 1963 when JFK was riding in Dallas if he thought that he would be entering eternity that day. Folks, we don't ever know when we are going to die. So we need to make sure that we are ready to go. Now, in 
1 Corinthians 15, so I'm going to ask you if you will to turn over there for just a moment, and then we're going to go to the book of Thessalonians because it describes the things that take place in the rapture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, notice what Paul says. Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, when you and I think of mystery, we think of something that's hard to understand or something that's got a, a plot that we've got to try and figure out. Well, that's not a mystery according to the Bible. A mystery according to the Scripture is something that we can only understand because God has revealed it to us. That's what Paul is saying. Behold, I show you a mystery. Something that was not known in the Old Testament. Resurrection, yes. Rapture, no. Paul said, I'm showing you a mystery. We shall all be changed. We're not, we shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed. So the first thing I want you to see is about the, revel about the rapture is there is revelation. Jesus said it's going to happen. Just as sure as Jesus came the first time, he is coming back again. That's why he shared the scripture in Matthew in Luke, it also speaks about that also. In Luke 17, uh, 26, it talks not only about Noah, but it also talks about Lot. That God is going to reveal what is taking place. So what is he trying to show us? Well, the rapture is going to take place. And now who does that involve? It involves the church. Those who have been saved, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, those are the ones who are saved. Now, the scripture says that he has not appointed us to wrath. What does that mean? It means that he has not appointed us to go through the tribulation. So what God has to do is, just like in the days of Noah, when God brought judgment, what did he do? He took Noah and his family out. What did God do before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? He took Lot and his family out. So what does God say about the church before the world enters this great tribulation? He says to us that he is going to take the church out. He reveals to us that he is going to take that person. Behold, I show you this mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now, sleep was uh, something that was uh, synonymous with sleep or death. Now, he said we shall not all die but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. So God says there's something that has to take place in this body that God is going to do something fantastic. He is going to change these bodies. Now, in the book of 1 Thessalonians, and I hope you'll turn there with me, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, I'll give you a moment to turn there, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, Paul writes these words, but I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep or who have died that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now, here is Paul, 
again speaking of this rapture. Now the believers at Thessalonica had thought the resurrection had already come. And so Paul is writing to them to help them to understand what the rapture means. And so he told them, he said, I don't want you to be ignorant. What was he doing? Not only the, the rapture of the church is their revelation, but God uses this rapture as a means of reassurance, of hope. Not will I hope it'll be, but hope in the scripture is confident expectation. It's something that is real, that you can bank on, that is true. That's always been true. This, this blessed hope. That's why they said looking for that blessed hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice what he says here. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have died. What they were saying was there was no hope because they had died. And Paul said, no, you don't have all the story. You don't understand what I've been trying to teach you. What I've been trying to teach you is this, that there is something beyond the grave. Behold, I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we are going to be changed. God gives reassurance to the child of God. I remember many years ago when I was saved and for a period of time, I was just going through the motions. And I, I read this a few days ago, and I thought, boy, this described me to a T when I was lost. And the article I read was a difference between a believer and a child of God. You say, well, what's the difference? Well, let me share a couple things with you because I believe it's very accurate. A believer, they believe in Jesus. But a child of God not only believes in Jesus, but he, he or she follows his commands. It's not just lip service. A believer, when they would tithe, they tithe when there's no risk. A child of God is going to tithe whatever the risk because he or she knows that God's faithful. A believer will sacrifice when it's convenient. A child of God will sacrifice no matter the cost. A believer will twist the Bible to fit the circumstances. Have you ever talked with someone and they say, well, yeah, I believe in Christ, and, uh, but then they live any way they want to live? A child of God, a Christian, doesn't conform to fit their circumstances. The Christian conforms to the lifestyle of the Word of God. Amen? Now, Jesus wants them to be reassured. So what does he tell us? He says in verse 14 of chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. In other words, not only is there revelation and there's reassurance, but Paul goes back to the resurrection that's why it is so very important that we connect the cross with the resurrection because the resurrection gives credence to the cross. The resurrection was God's stamp of approval that Jesus Christ had paid the price on the cross. 
And when you read, begin to read the, the preaching through the book of Acts, they always mention the resurrection because the resurrection brings life. Now, notice what Paul says. Verse 14, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Well, what's the big deal about that? The big deal is this. If Jesus did not resurrect from the dead, we have no hope of being resurrected either. It's what Paul says. He said, listen, if you've got hope, you've got to go back to where Jesus not only died on the cross, but He rose again the third day. Because the resurrection seals who we are. And because Jesus Christ rose again, and because Jesus Christ had a resurrection body, those things will be true of you and I at the time of the rapture when Jesus takes the church out. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So what is he saying? They had loved ones who had died, who had passed away. Is there any hope for them? Many of us today have lost family members. There are some here today who've lost children because they've passed. There are those today we've, we've lost people that we love. And if there is no resurrection, there is no hope. But Jesus, speaking through Paul, said this, that those who have died, those bodies that are in the grave or in the ocean or in the desert sand somewhere, God is going to resurrect. But first of all, he says this, that God is going to bring those children of God with him. Why is that possible? Because to be absent from the body is to be present with God. That's the word of God. Knowing that if we die in the Lord, to be dead is to be present with the Lord. That is the hope, the reassurance that the child of God has for those loved ones. So Paul said, you don't need to worry about it. You don't need to be like those people without God that have no hope. And by the way, you can tell when you speak to a family that's lost, you can tell that they don't have hope. It's very easy when you see a family at a funeral home or at a, a funeral and one is saved and one is lost. Yeah, there's sorrow in the, the child of God, but there's that hope because of what Jesus Christ has done, because He rose from the dead. The Scripture says, since we believe this, we believe also that those who have died, God's going to bring with Him. And He says this, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that they which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. That is the mystery. That's the revelation. That's what God is doing. He is revealing to the church about the rapture and what's going to take place. He says because that person has died and their uh, spirit has gone to heaven, their body is still in the grave, when Jesus comes back at the rapture, He is going to bring those who have died with Him and then there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. 
Isn't that going to be awesome, folks, to know that that loved one who is in the Lord is going to be raised? Now notice what it says. It said that those who are alive, they're, they're going to be watching those who are coming with Him and those who are being resurrected. And He said, they're, those who are alive are not going to go first. But those who have died will go first. And then, verse 16, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Isn't it awesome to know that God is going to come back? The Lord Jesus Christ, He said, as soon as, as sure as I go back or go to heaven, I'm coming back. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you and if I do, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's the Scripture. That's the Word of God. That's the rapture, folks. That's what God's going to do. He said there's going to be a resurrection, but aren't you glad there's going to be a reunion? Think about this, folks. Those loved ones, maybe it's a mom, maybe it's a dad, maybe it's a, a daughter, maybe it's a son, maybe it's a, a little baby. There's going to be a reunion, folks. That's the blessing of the rapture of the church is that there's going to be a reunion not only with our loved ones, but those who have gone before us. The Moses, the Elijah, the Enochs, but most of all, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we're going to see. The Bible says we will meet Him in the air. That's the promise of God that we are looking for Jesus. Oh, it is so beautiful to know that God speaks about the resurrection and what God can do. You know, you think about, you look around and you, you think about a, a small little acorn that can make a tremendous oak tree. You never know what a little nut can do. Probably the last few days, you've probably seen some of these little uh, caterpillars crawling around on the ground. You know, one day they're going to get in that thing and they're going to spin that cocoon and, and they're going to go through that metamorphosis uh, and they're going to be changed from a caterpillar to a butterfly. See, that's what God does with a child of God. And ladies, did you know that a long time ago, what you were probably wearing on your left finger used to just be coal, but now it's a beautiful diamond. Isn't it awesome to know what God can do? Isn't it wonderful to know that, that Jesus Christ is coming back? I remember very vividly when I was saved. Eddie Martin had preached a message and had watched some things on what would happen when Jesus came back. And what I realized was I was kind of like what I shared before. I believed in Jesus, but I was not a follower. I'd said all the right things, and I was baptized, but I wasn't any more saved than the man in the moon was. But I remember very vividly the night I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And He changed me. And he put a desire in my heart to live for Him. I am not perfect by any means. I am nowhere close. But I'll tell you, 
God put in my heart a desire for him. And that's what God puts into the child of God. And he puts in them that hope of the resurrection. I asked a man yesterday if he was saved, if he was a child of God. He told me he was, and when I left, I thought, boy, I didn't, re I shouldn't have, I didn't really word that the way I should have because what I should have asked him was this. Sir, if you were to die right now and you were to go stand before Jesus and Jesus would ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you tell him? Because about everybody I've ever asked the question, are you a Christian, have told me yes. And I know everybody's not saved. But see, the question is, if I stand before God, what am I going to tell him? I can't tell him I was good enough. And I couldn't tell him that I worked enough or I went to church enough or was baptized twice. What he's going to ask me is, what did you do with my son? Did you trust him to save you? And are you following him? That's the question. So the invitation this morning is very, very simple. Do you know that you're a child of God? The scripture says, These things have I written unto you that you may know that you're a child of God. Not that you may hope that you are or you think that you are, but you may know without a shadow of a doubt. I am so thankful today to know that if I died right now, I'm going to be with Jesus. And if the rapture comes in the next five minutes, I'm gonna be with Jesus. How about you, my friend? How about you? Do you have that confidence? Do you have that assurance that you know that you're going to heaven? Folks, that's what the scripture is all about. The Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world that we might have life and life everlasting. My prayer today is this, that if you've never trusted him, that today that you would first of all acknowledge that you're a sinner. God, you know who I am. You know everything about my life. God, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. But Lord, I believe what your word says. That the gospel is that Jesus Christ died for my sin according to the scripture that he was buried that he rose again the third day and that if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead I can be saved and if that's your desire you tell him you surrender your life to him and God will save you right now. God bless you. Let's sing our invitation hymn. BJ, you come and lead us, my friend. Uh, as we, uh, I about said as we stand and sing, we can't stand and sing, but folks, I want to hear you sing, okay? Sing loud enough so I, can't have, so I don't have to hear just BJ, amen? amen. He's got a great voice, but... Let's just sing it out to the Lord. Amen. Roll your windows down and sing it to him, okay?